Well, hey, everybody. According to StreamYard, we're alive, and uh, that's that's my favorite word when it comes to these things because you just never know how things are going to go south. Um, and I was having a discussion about that very thing with today's guest, Mary Robinette Kowal. You may have heard of her. Uh, she is the author of the Glamorous Histories series, uh, Ghost Talkers, the Lady Astronaut series. Uh, she's also currently the president of, of SFWA and an award-winning podcast. Uh, she is one of the hosts of the award-winning podcast, Writing Excuses, uh, which is uh, one of my favorite writing podcasts, I got to tell you, uh. Mary. So. And I'm not just saying that because you guys had me on an episode. I really, truly mean it. Well, thank you. I think that's part of, I think that buttering up is part of why we got you on in the video. No, that's, no. that's what it's all <laughs> your, about. Your expertise. Yeah, your expertise is why we invited you on. So thank you so much. I, we, you know, you and I, you were on my podcast a couple of years ago now. Yeah, it's um, been a while. We've done it. We've kind of crossed paths several times at mm -hmm. conferences and and that sort of thing. So uh, and you know at uh, S, uh, SFWA too. So that's oh, yeah. been uh, it's been interesting yeah. to watch things evolve uh, with that conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Been very happy so, with that. Yeah, yes. we've, we've really liked it when we've been able to partnership with Draft to Digital. So yes, um, and I'm glad that it's. I'm hoping we can to... find all kinds of new and additional ways we can we can partner up so we'll talk more <laughs> we'll talk so if you're unfamiliar uh listeners and viewers uh sfwa is the science fiction and fantasy writers of america did i get it mm -hmm. all right that is i correct. am so terrible i am better with the actual acronyms than i am with breaking them out into what they yeah. mean true statement <laughs> So, uh, but yes, and um, you know, I uh, I've attended a few of these and uh, really always enjoyed it. Uh, what well, you were not president when I first started going to these things, uh, but no. you've stepped into that role. So, what mm -hmm. what's that been like? So, I had been. Oh, hello, uh, and now we have my cat with us. This is that's Elsie. fine. Hey, look, this is now it's now it's a real we're in now, post, now we're post really pandemic on the America right now. Yeah. Everybody's got a cat or a child or something that pops yes. up on their video feed. <laughs> Hi, kid. <laughs> Are you going to try to tangle in my cord? Really appreciate that. So nice. Um, so I had been on the board previously, um, uh, close to a decade ago at this point. Uh, I was on as secretary and then later VP. Yeah. Um, and then remained involved in the organization in various ways. So, um, getting you know, getting backstage, I I knew I knew what to expect mostly. The thing that has been a delight uh, about joining, being on the board this time, um, is that this particular set of board members, um, the just they're so committed. It's such like healthy, good discussion right. where we we don't always. Like, it's not that everyone is totally in lockstep with the best way to execute policies, but uh, but we are all totally in sync on what, like, the path we want the organization to be on, which is uh, inclusive. And um, the, the phrase that I've been using is that we we want SIFWA, which is how you pronounce SFWA. I, I didn't want to say I messed it's that okay. up, too. <laughs> it, 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 SFWA is fine. I know. Um, the other one, <laughs> SIFWA, does sound like a disease. We, we all know that. I've always uh, thought that. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I've been the, – the thing we've been saying is there are so many gatekeepers in the publishing mm -hmm. world, and we want SIFWA to be a gate opener. And so we've been really – Focusing on on working on that, uh, especially over the past year with the pandemic, some of the, the tools that have become available to us because of right. you know, hello, we are all living in these little boxes, um, have have also allowed us to make the convention more accessible, uh, right. and to um, to do things like Sifwa because it's it's an organization for professional writers. You have to hit a certain publishing threshold to become a member mm -hmm. and um and and what we've been able to do is create a, a year-round nebula membership which is for people like for anyone like you don't have to have published anything yet to to join in that oh, way and, and get access to to community and um and so we're hoping hoping things like that will help and that's that's more of a nurturing kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? You're actually yeah. trying to encourage the growth of the community through that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been very exciting. That's the kind of thing I've always felt has has been missing from a lot of the 
the writer organizations that are out there, um, that there's very little done for the will be author. Um, it's not, yeah. it's not unheard of for there to be something, but it's usually very limited. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. And this is, uh, so, you know, as I say, this is uh, one of the silver linings that we have, um, carefully polished. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's been some, uh, interesting, uh, we'll just say events, uh, so mm. that have been associated with CIFO over the past, maybe four years. Um, <laughs> anything you'd like to dredge up and comment on or should we um, just quietly move along <laughs> well i think so a lot of the ones that people think about are, are not actually us it's a lot yeah. of the world con which is yeah. not our organization right. right um uh you know or world fantasy which is again not our organization uh the things that we've you know that like when i think about a lot of interesting events over the past four years i'm thinking about stuff like Disney must pay. And... Which I definitely, we had a question pop up already about oh, okay. Dean Foster. So uh, uh, do let, let's pop, I'll pop that up and let's talk about Disney must pay. Because you and just before we we started chatting live, you and I had sort of a mini cast of our own uh, yeah, right. <laughs> going off on what's been happening here. But uh, do you want to break down? So there, uh, Clark is uh, asking, has there been any, any results for, for Alan Dean Foster? And that is directly tied in with the Disney must pay or hashtag Disney must pay. Um, do you want to give kind of a, a rundown of what's happening there? Yeah. So um, recognizing that I have to be a little bit careful about what yes. I, the, the details with which I can get into this. Perfectly um, fine. I don't. So <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, for the short form for people who are not familiar with this is that Alan Dean Foster, who wrote the novelization for Star Wars uh, and Aliens, came to Sifwa because he was not being paid royalties. And, um, and it his agent had just been trying to figure out who owned the rights now. Um, right. We finally found out that it was Disney now. Uh, and again, just trying to get through, it finally got escalated up to me. Um, and this is over the course of like two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gets escalated up to me. And um, we, in order to get them to... Uh, to kind of move forward, we wound up doing a social media campaign called Disney Must Pay because we were fairly certain that there were additional authors out there. Yes. Um, so where we are with Alan is that the alien titles are resolved to his satisfaction. Star Wars is not. Yeah. Um, and uh, they are, they have gone non-communicative again. Um okay. Uh, there was a deadline of uh, March 15th. Uh, I checked in again this morning. Today happens to be March 18th. Uh, March 18th as we are recording this. listening in the future, yeah. Yes. So, um, uh, so you know, it's, it's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, they say that they're deeply committed, uh, and here we are. Um, we, we sent two authors to them um, out of the... A, a, around a dozen that contacted us, uh, right. Alan and um, James Kahn. James, they have taken care of him. We are very happy about that. Um, but we have uh, we have all of these others, that, and we, we had been waiting to see how, uh, how Disney treated the two test cases. Um, and it's uh, not ideal. Uh, they're doing yeah. they're doing things that are kind of classic union busting techniques, but they're applying it to like volunteer service organizations. So they're they are, uh, you know, if if a writer's agent comes to me and says, I don't understand this thing, this form that I have to fill out. And I look at the form. I'm like, I think it's just a pretty standard, although 60 page form that's to get paid. It's their vendor service agreement, which is like ridiculously long. It's the same agreement for everybody. So yeah. I'm like, hey, hey, Disney, give me a copy of the form. I'll run it through our legal so that they can vet it. I'm sure it's fine. And then I can tell the authors that it's okay to sign. And the response is, I'm already talking to the agent. And I'm like, but the agent literally asked me yeah. for help with this. I'm sorry, this is need to know only. I'm like, 
<laughs> this is a form thousands of people sign. Yes, yes. <laughs> and the agent has asked for help, and you're telling me no. Um, I okay. No. Yeah, yeah. My other favorite, my other favorite thing is just like, um, so we're gonna send these additional authors to you. What subject line would you would you like? Like, just tell them to email me. Okay. Uh, do you have any information you need in there? Just tell them to email me. I don't think it's appropriate for anything to come from Sifu. And I'm like, wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Noted. But they're they're still they have not backed down from the um, uh, from the uh, uh, rights don't transfer. You know. Right. Uh, and actually, that rights don't transfer is a new phrase because I I said there have been more developments, and I mentioned that there is about a dozen authors. Um, we have uh, we have. We will be announcing, um, like doing a big formal announcement. You all get the scoop. Uh, that um, I like. I like getting the scoop. That's what well. I I have mentioned it before to other places, <laughs> yeah. but um, there you go. No, thanks but for we're shooting but, uh, me down. Yeah. yeah, but you you are getting the scoop that there's a website coming too. Oh, okay. All right. Um, we so we've formed a coalition with a, a task force across multiple author organizations. Right. Um, so Novelist Inc., Authors Guild, Writers in Crime, yep. Um, yep. horror writers, like you know, just basically everybody recognizes that it looks like it's just this one. Everyone thinks Alan Dean Foster, but this is something <clears throat> that affects everybody. Yes. Um, there's a hypothetical that we mentioned. Uh, in our initial thing um, that Disney or any company, any company, if if Disney's thing that that, that it's possible to take a contract and uh, have the rights, but not the obligations. Right. Um, like if if that were a thing, then any company could take a property yep. and then sell it to a sister company mm -hmm. and break that contract. Turns out. That hypothetical is not actually a hypothetical. Oh, yeah. So who's doing who's doing this, or can you share? Oh yeah. No. Okay. No, good. I'm going to share. <laughs> so um, uh, Fox had uh, Buffy, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think Indiana Jones, but uh, but let's take Buffy as the example, even right. though we have. They have the uh, X-Men. They have a lot of properties. We have, yeah. we have a list yeah. of, of yeah. properties that, that this has happened with. Um, but we'll use Buffy as our example. Okay. Um, so Fox owned Buffy, licensed it to Dark Horse Comics. Correct. Disney bought Fox, withdrew the license from Dark Horse, and granted to the license to Boom. Boom says, quote... Royalties don't transfer. Boom. Guess who one of the owners of Boom is? And if you're guessing Disney, you are correct. I, I, I would have assumed Disney. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So that hypothetical oh. we were talking about is 100% not a hypothetical. Yes. So they're like they are not the sole owner of Boom, and and my no, bet is no. But there's a there's a definite conflict of interest there, and yeah. it's it's obvious what's happening. I mean, that's yeah. many, well, we can't really assume anything on on any sort of legal grounds, but we no, can assume no, we as can't. human beings, like, right? So, like, and and this is the thing, like, to be to to, to that I just want to draw a line under. Yeah, that we do not know what Boom was told. Um, we right. know from another publisher, and I'm not going to get into details on this one. Uh, we know from another publisher that they were told that um, that the licenses that they were being granted were clear of royalties. Okay. So so that that messaging was messaging that did come from Disney. So we have no idea what Boom's been told. My, you know, I I would like to believe that they are operating in good faith because they've been very pro author uh, and creator in, right. in in other properties, but. <clears throat> yeah. But but we have this situation. So right. that's going to be fun. Yeah. And where this is important, uh, even for the indie author crowd, which is mostly who, who we draw in, um, is, you know, we are sometimes, I've been approached numerous times about selling certain rights to some of my properties. And uh, now I have to question whether or not that's a, a wise idea. Even if I, it, the contract seems iron, ironclad and I've had it vetted by my attorneys and, you know, I've done mm -hmm. everything possible to do due diligence with that contract, this opens a loophole that could still rob me of certain rights. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. If if uh, if we hit a thing where they can cherry pick from contracts, right? You know, if that if that gets established as precedent, that's that's a serious problem for like every writer. Yeah, yeah. This to, well, copyright and IP law are all already sort of ridiculous uh, in yeah. scope and yeah. and difficult to understand. Uh, and so when you have scenarios like this, now it's just becoming downright dangerous. And you know, with with Alan Dean Foster's story, there's also some tragic elements. There's you know, um, he, this is not a good time for him to have to fight this battle. Um, yeah, you know, I don't want to. Uh, dish on on his personal life or anything, but there's a lot going on in his life, and this is this is a blow he didn't need. So yeah. that's that's why it's good to have organizations like Sifwa and Nink and others that um, that are uh, advocates for these authors and their yeah. rights. So yeah, and I'm I'm happy that we have gotten some money for him. I would like the the remaining yeah. titles to be resolved, um, but right. Well, if you just consider. Uh, okay, so they bought, is it LucasArts or I don't remember Lucas which, Film. Lucasfilm. So Lucasfilm and they bought Fox. Uh, so they own the the rights, the intellectual property rights to properties with under those labels. That's mm -hmm. a huge swath huge. Of, of IP. And there are so many novelizations and, you know, adaptations out there under those two labels. Mm-hmm. This affects a very large population of the author community. Yeah. I mean, this is a lot. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Good for you guys yeah. for taking the forefront on this. I mean, we somebody had to. <laughs> Hashtag Disney must pay. Yeah, that's I, correct. I, I was telling uh, Mary before the show that I I have uh, I probably share something along those lines once a day at a minimum. I have a I have a tweet deck I use to scan everything, and I actually have an entire tab dedicated to that hashtag because. Oh. It Thank infuriates you. me so. Uh, yeah. So. But and, you, and go ahead, I'm I, sorry. I will say that one of the things that we're asking people is to, to raise awareness by using the hashtag Disney must pay. Um, but we are also asking people not to do a, um, a broad boycott. That's what I was about because, to ask about. Um, because the problem with a broad boycott is that it affects authors who are not involved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there are authors that Disney is paying royalty on, or more accurately, their licensees are paying royalties. Right. Right. Um, and, and I think Disney is paying royalties as well to, to modern contracts. Um, this is just something that's happening with contracts, as far as we can tell, contracts yeah. that are transferred. Um, so, you know, it's like we don't want to penalize people. It, it'll, it will disproportionately affect authors who, you know, who have who are blameless in this so we're asking people not to do a, a broad boycott but to you know to help raise awareness uh to support the authors by buying books that they are being paid royalties on right yeah well yeah that that uh that's a very good point and before we start uh broadcasting i had said that my you know my family and i had kind of started boycotting stuff but now i I need to reconsider because <laughs> I had thought about that because there are definitely people who get hurt in this who, yeah. who aren't involved in the treachery. Um, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I don't want us to, I don't want this to be the Disney must pay hour. Uh, right. Per right. Se. Yes. Let's talk about uh, other things. Yeah. Let's get happier. Uh, so <laughs> that, that does piss me off though, by the way, and it should piss off a lot of authors. So, yeah. um, we'll, but we'll move on. Uh, so, uh, let me, Mark Leslie Lefebvre had a question. I want us to, to chat about it too. Uh, so considering your talent and experience in multiple creative pursuits, uh, how do you decide when and where to switch hats and channel your energy? All right. So there's a couple <laughs> of things. That, so there's a couple of things you should know. Uh, yeah. one is, um, <laughs> um, I, I think of this as, um, as juggling, juggling plates. Right. Okay. Um, keeping I was one plate. Go with cats, but yep. No, yep. no. Um, I, I can do that, <laughs> or I can herd them. I'm pretty good at herding cats. Right. Um, but uh, so you keep one plate in the air. That's that's no big deal. You can mm -hmm. you can absolutely do that. Right. Uh, two plates in the air. If you're a juggler, okay, you're still fine. 
The more, pl- but you you know, if you want to impress anyone, you have to be doing really fancy patterns with the plates. Yes. Um, the more plates you have in the air, the more impressed people get that you have any plates in the air. Like it's like seven plates. How are they doing that? And really, it's just like up in the air, and then I've. Yeah. And and my secret is that I use a very tightly focused spotlight. Okay. Uh, and also uh, refill my fountain pen. Uh, very tightly focused <laughs> spotlight. The listeners don't know that you were pointing at the blue on your. Oh right, sorry. <laughs> your thumb and fin- forefinger. <laughs> um, so very tightly focused spotlight. Who uh, so that no one can see the shattered crockery at my feet. Okay. Um, so anytime someone asks me for advice about organizing my time in my life, I'm like, you have to understand. I am standing on shattered crockery all the time. There's, I drop a lot of plates. But what That's I've done um, is I'm going to show you my, my calendar and to-do list, and it is, I will grant you, uh, slightly terrifying. Okay. So there's two things. Let me just make sure there's nothing on there that's... No. Um, so uh, the night before I go to bed, I write down kind of a rough overview of my day. Now, you'll okay. see this thing that says craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Um, And look, there you are. Um, And then you see sharing. So I have identified, I've I've sat down and thought about the things that make me happy. Um, And the more, uh, and and basically there's like, these are called essences. I got this idea from a a woman named Laura Levine. Um, The idea between, the difference between form and essence. So form is something you can touch or buy and essence is how it makes you feel. And anything that makes you happy, um, like the, the happier uh, an, a thing makes you, the more likely it is to combine multiples of those essences. And everybody has like five to seven that make them happy. So what I did um, about a year ago was, because I was not balancing my time well, um, was that I identified those essences and I made calendar blocks and uh like identified what each task kind of, you know, which essences each task sort of ticked off yep. of the things on my calendar. And what I discovered was that everything I was doing was an impact slot because I like to do things that make a difference, right. which explained why I was feeling tired and burned out all the time because I was only feeding one aspect of self. Okay. Right. So craftsmanship is a thing that makes me really happy. Like I super enjoy it. Um, and I enjoy sharing you know, this yeah. this is actually in a sharing slot. Right. Um, it's uh, so then what I do is I have my to do list. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. I identify kind of two minute tasks, things that I can check off real fast. I identify, oh, this is a priority. I really have to do this today. Um, and then I revisit my timeline. And uh, when I revisit it, I I get more specific about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So in the craftsmanship, I've had. Uh, a fountain pen that I've needed to do a repair on for ages and it's just keeps and you got to it today and I got to it today <laughs> and I feel like I feel so much rest more rested because yes. because I had been doing all of those other things and I finished that and then immediately sat down and cleared my inbox and got to inbox zero excellent um which is not technically craftsmanship but but it it made me feel satisfied so um so that's what I try to do and it it has helped enormously to help me set barriers. Right. Um, and the other thing that I have found is that when when something comes in, if I think, okay, well, what, you know, a request comes in, I'm like, what what things does this tick off? Uh, tick off sounds wrong. Uh, what boxes does this check? You, happiness you, you angrily boxes? solve these problems. Ah! Um, <laughs> if, it, if it's only checking one, then I'm like, maybe I don't want to do that at all. Right. And so I just decline it. So it's made it much easier to identify the things that I want to decline and which things that I want to prioritize. Because also, if if it's something that checks multiple boxes, then that gives me multiple time slots that I can put it in, which means that it's going to be scheduled sooner. Like I said, this is this one is in sharing, but right. this actually... Um, this actually ticks, uh, uh, checks the, the sharing, uh, discovery, and... Right. And, and narrative boxes. So this actually, this was like, you know, yeah. I knew this was going to be fun. Good. <laughs> That's good to hear. But yeah. and, and people don't often think about this, but you're, what you 
are revealing is that these tasks, they, they carry some weight, yeah. you know, and the more of these things we have on our, our plate, uh, to bring the plates back in, um, yeah. the, the heavier things start to feel. And you're, you're focusing on the, I, I like that approach by the way, cause I'm a big fan of, uh, how many things can I get out of this one, uh, tool service task yeah. whatever i like to get it i like to squeeze as much out of that stuff as i possibly can so yeah. i like well, your the, system but it's very elaborate it it's <laughs> it like so I, i'll tell you that if you try it it takes the the thing about it is that it takes a about it took me about three months before I started seeing the results from it, yeah. because um, because of all of the things that were already on the calendar. Yeah. But I have I have weekends and evenings again. Yeah, yeah. Which is That's, those are nice. I, I miss yeah. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it's <laughs> been one of the few things sometimes that has kept me really functional over the last year. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll also say as a full disclosure for people um, and a reminder that everybody's brain is wired differently. Right. Uh, the the two kind of um, expansion packs that my brain has are uh, depression and ADHD, mm-hmm. um, which is like juggling plates with butter on your fingers. Right. So um, you know, medication is something that helps you wash your hands. Uh, this also is is like, oh, okay. I just I I I was able to wipe my hands off with a towel. Right. Uh, but if I don't do that every day, there's butter on my hands again. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good analogy too. Uh, butter on the hands. You know what that reminds me of uh, is uh, Xenocide uh, to bring Orson Scott Card and Ninder back yes. into their, their discussion. Uh, and those everyone listening is like, what? And it comes down to I had read a collection of essays about the novel Ender's Game, saw that Mary had written one and leveraged my already existing email address connection to her to tell her I liked the essay. And that's uh, where we got started. Yeah. And then I did like the essay. Uh, that was a, actually a really good collection. I reread that book like at least once a year or so. It's a, I'm, it's a passion of mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um, it was very formative for me. And, and, that, and that was a, a fairly constant reread now. Now, yeah. uh, now I'm very much in the, there are too many books and not enough That's time. Right. I know. <laughs> so, I'm in the same, same boat. And uh, there's so many, there's so many I love and want to revisit. And then I look at the to be read pile and right? I feel like it's that's more anxiety. Who needs that anxiety? Yeah. anxiety? Uh, so Alyssa, who is a, uh, one of our uh, one of DDD's own, uh, she says, "I'd love to hear more about writing excuses. If I've never heard any episodes, where would you suggest someone start? Does the podcast com- uh, commitment help or hurt your actual writing productivity?" So, thanks, Alyssa. I'd recommend starting in season ten. Um, uh, we did that one. We structured that as a master class. Mm. And uh, so it's it's a really good way to to kind of step through sort of the writing process, and then you can continue forward. You can uh, dip into the podcast at, at any point. Um, we've this season we're doing something where we're uh, each um, we're, we're doing a series of smaller master classes that are each um, a couple of weeks long. So we just started one on poetry uh, last week. Right. Um, the, I think it was last week. Um, uh, but the beginning of the year, we started one on, on the business of writing, mostly focused on on trad, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but not all. It. I mean, there, there's plenty of stuff in there that's applicable to other things. Um, and how does it balance? It's actually great. Um, so I, uh, I, I, my co-hosts are um, Brandon Sanderson, Dan Wells, Howard Taylor, um, and then we each season we add um, a, a two to three uh, season long co hosts, and and one of us will one or two of us will. I'm swap right out. here, Mary. All you ever have to do <laughs> is ask. I um, happen to I, have a tiny bit of podcasting experience. I I, I love you dearly. Um, however, no, one of no. the reasons I, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and and and, and say it like it is. Yeah, no problem. Um, what one of the things. Because this is a funny side story. One of the things that um, Dan Howard and Brandon, who started the podcast, yeah. were very proud of when they started it was how diverse it was. Because they had a fantasy writer, a horror writer, and yeah. a um, comic writer uh, right. who were all straight white men from Utah 
right. who were Mormon living within three miles of each other. Super <laughs> diverse. So they diversified some by, by bringing me on, uh, which takes care of the gender. And I'm also not Mormon, nor do I live in Utah, but uh, we are all still white. So the co-hosts that we bring on um, are always coming from a different walk of life. Yeah. Um, so... Love yeah. you dearly, but no. we'll have you on yeah. as a guest anytime. Being cis but... white male strikes me down once again. Well, well, uh, who would have expected uh. that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so that's that's the thing. So the reason that it it doesn't take up that much time is we um, what we do is we batch episodes. So we'll get together and uh, record. Um, they're, they're also only 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and we're not that smart. Um, but, uh, so we batch episodes. Uh, so we'll record, we'll get together on a a day and record like eight, eight episodes over the course of the day. Um, and, and since we rotate, it does, it means we don't all have to be there to record all of those. So it's, it's, uh, but you know, it's, it's figuring out, finding that balance. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, it's not easy uh, to balance that kind of thing because uh, it's a very different skill set from writing. Uh, but I, at least in my experience, and I think this is probably true for you, just knowing you as little as I know you, Mary, uh, that you know because you shift gears, I think this is I, – I've personally, in analyzing you from afar, I feel like one of the reasons you are into so many different things is because it helps you. Each, each thing that you do seems to help you uh, sort of – rejuvenate and uh, attack the other thing with new energy. Am I anywhere close on that? Uh, there is a reason that <laughs> my uh, one of the the, the boxes, um, my, my essences is discovery. Yes. Like uh, learning new things makes me so happy. I get really excited when there's um, when it's it's like, oh, I don't know this thing. Tell me all about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I mean, yeah, that's that was, a, I mean, that was, I think you, you may remember that I started quizzing you. I'm like, tell me about draft to digital. What is this self-publishing <laughs> thing? And you know, um, I'm glad though, that you ask about that stuff because there, there was a stigma uh, about self-publishing for, for many years. Yeah. Uh, it's something we still sort of see in certain organizations. I'm really, really ha- proud of CIFLA for sort of stepping forward and, and starting to consider, you know, these are authors too. And, uh, yeah. You know, yes, yeah. there's there's a difference. Yes, there is. We know yeah. that. Uh, but you know, that doesn't mean you don't you don't approach it. There's specialized ways to uh, to incorporate this group in there. I think. All right. What yeah. are some of the ways you guys are doing that? I mean, if you don't mind. So we changed one of the the first things was we changed our membership requirements so that uh, because the way they were originally structured, they um, prevented indie writers from joining at all. So we um, even after we said yes, you're welcome, we we then had to to make changes um, to the how things were structured. Uh, we're actually having a meeting this weekend to to revisit again the qualifying rules um, yeah. because we've realized that. Uh, the um, we came up with a good path for novelists who are indies, but uh, for people who are on the traditional path, um, they can come in as a short story writer right. and and join as an associate. And there's not a good path for that for indies. So, Meaning so we're looking they, at uh, we're publishing say novellas or short stories right. uh, as eBooks. There's not, there's not really yeah. a way in. Yeah. Right. So we're, so we're looking at, at how to, how to fix that. Um, we're trying to make sure that when we, one of the things that we do very consciously when we are staffing committees is try to make sure that, uh, that, that people from um, underrepresented groups are, yeah. are in there and within. So in addition to, to the demographically underrepresented. Um, yeah. Uh, we also, within science fiction and fantasy, because of that that long stigma on on indies, we we also try to make sure that um, that we are you know we're, we're thinking about that. Right. Um, I, I'm really excited. The uh, um, Jeffy Kennedy is running for president, uh, unopposed for CIFWA. Um, you've, you've had enough. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I said I was, I mean, I, I knew coming in I was going to be a one-term president. Um, yeah. 
because I. Yeah, it's stuff. hard. It's and you have twelve thousand other things that, you, <laughs> that demand. It's basically your it's the twelve thousand other things. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, on, honestly, because I'm keeping you know that that plate thing that I was talking about, yeah. one of the plates that I keep dropping Sifwa plates, which does not make me happy. Right. So um, Jeffy Kennedy is uh, running unopposed. She's uh, she's hybrid. She's got a, a strong track record as an Indian, very involved in that community. She's a romance writer as part of her science fiction identity. Yeah. Um, so I'm so excited. She's got, she's bringing in a ton of good ideas. She's, I, I asked her to run because um, of all of the board members. She's kind of, she's very frequently the one who is driving and focused and getting stuff done. Right. So, and I'm, I am, uh, I'm going to take seats on some committees. Like I'm, I'm going to stay involved with Disney must pay, but then I'll also be on uh, the fundraising committee. Yeah. Um, so, but that way I, I don't, I felt like I was not serving the organization well, um, because my yeah. focus is so stra- scattered, but you still managed to, to do quite a bit of good while being, while being in the role. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this past year has been a ride. <laughs> Did you, I mean, you know, and nobody, I think, everyone knows, <sighs> I think, when you get into a role like that, that there is always going to be the possibility of uh, some kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, it's still, I still can't imagine you were in any way prepared for Disney Must Pay. No, uh, no, definitely not. And and having that and the <clears throat> pandemic, so we had to completely yes. redo the little like, thing the called the conference. pandemic. Yeah, ha- having those two things hit simultaneously um, has been a little consuming. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it's been a little. Been well, a that's why busy. the fact that you do anything other than Sifwa is what is uh, fairly amazing. Then shattered uh, crockery, shattered, shattered crockery, crockery all the around my feet. Shattered crockery, can't. the Mary Robinette Cole story. <laughs> it's, that's that's going to be that's going to be my the, the title of my memoir. Shattered yes, crockery. There you go. I will read that memoir if I am alive long enough for it to uh, come into existence. I got my own uh, yeah, shattered that... crockery. <laughs> right. Um, so, so I, hey, there's one thing, if you don't mind, I just saw something in the comments that I kind of want to quickly address. Yes. Someone, someone said that uh, that they thought that uh, having depression and ADHD were were necessary. Oh right? yes, and, I did see that. Uh, and I just s- want to say that I, I don't think that you need to. to okay, flash I don't need to call it. Up All right. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't want to call them out, but but that's a, a very common thing that I, I hear in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say that I don't think that is true, partly because I have friends who have neither, who are fantastically good writers uh, and perfectly successful. And the other thing is that the times that it is hardest to write are when those two things are least under control. Like when right. those are not under control, that's when I have a hard time. I I do think that my writing is informed and the way I move through the world is informed by that. Mm-hmm. Um, like I like the fact that my brain grabs th- th- things from different places. Um, I, I don't like ADHD or ADD being described as a disorder. Right. Uh, my feeling on, on that one, like if I could cure depression and never have it again, Heartbeat yeah. done. Yes, thank you. I would, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, ADHD. <sighs> uh, I'm like, this is the way my brain is wired, and yeah. the reason that the problem with it isn't that this is the way my brain is wired. It's that normal was defined by people whose brain is not wired my that right this way, and and I like. I, I don't think that there is such a really and truly such a thing as neurotypical. I think that the people who defined neurotypical defined people whose brains were like theirs. Right. And I'm like, my brain is perfectly fine. It's a it's just a different set of wiring. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I don't have ADHD, uh, at least I, not that I'm aware. Uh, I, I was diagnosed like two <laughs> years ago, and in hindsight, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's things obvious. Things make sense, right? I mean, but I do uh, deal with, uh, you know, bouts of depression and high anxiety and that sort oh, of yeah. thing. So, And that, that can be crippling, and, you know, the advice you get from people is always well-meaning, but isn't always uh, comforting. Uh, no. So, yeah, I... I 
I too would cure depression uh, in a heartbeat if I had the ability. So yeah. we can unite. Well, let's, yes. let's work against author depression uh, as if you don't have enough things on your plate right, right now. Yeah. And when I say <laughs> I would cure, what I mean is if someone offered me a cure, <laughs> I would take right. that cure. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, that's a, that, that is a good point, though. There are, there are a lot of myths around the, uh, the writer mystique. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like alcoholism, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you have to be bombed out of your gourd in order to actually access your soul and write yeah. good words um no i i have tried writing drunk just as an experiment and it's terrible i only edit drunk <laughs> really <laughs> no, <I'm, laughs> no i know I'm you're kidding. i know you're joking but it's like oh wow <laughs> I, I oh, am, our brains uh, are wired different. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I am uh, one of those who does occasionally promote that stereotype of the, you know, the whiskey swilling author, um, because I do enjoy uh, bourbon and that sort of thing. But I never could write drunk. I, for one thing, once I've released all the inhibitions, that's not a good time for me to be attacking the page. Frankly, no, no. <laughs> I also get drowsy. <laughs> Same here. Or, I, or yeah. I have to, you know, get up and go to the men's room so often that it's, it's not worth the, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. worth any benefit I may have gotten. Uh, of course, now I do, I do a lot of writing on my phone, so I guess I could technically just carry that, oh, nice. that yeah, whole thing yeah. forward. So, um, so <laughs> <laughs> this went in a unanticipated the, uh, direction. So you, there's at least one famous writer who had a typewriter that they would take into the bathtub with them. They had like Trumbo. a Trumbo. Yes. Thank yes. You. Yeah. Yes. I I admire that, um, but I'm I'm sad that that had to be a reality for Trumbo. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, great great film by the way, and um, kind of caught it uh, by accident. I didn't realize there was a movie about his life. No, I, I, I didn't actually know that either. Studied him for a while, and then suddenly realized, and I can't remember the actor's name. He from Breaking Bad. Um, mm, I'm not going to be able to help you. Terrible with that. Um, so. One of the things, when you sent out a tweet to promote this this uh, live stream, mm -hmm. you mentioned anthologies as one of the topics. So I want to make sure we do actually talk about anthologies. Uh, what what uh, what did you have in mind? Because I didn't have any questions about anthologies, but we have a whole cool thing going on with Draft Digital's uh, collaboration tools and our uh, royalty splitting. So it all ties in. <laughs> yeah. So so one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, a lot recently is that, the, uh, and it, it was inspired by, um, by a, a question that someone else had asked, uh, which was, you know, where, what places do you collaborate with other authors? Mm -hmm. And and anthologies is actually one of those places that you collaborate with other authors, but people don't think about it as a collaboration right. uh, because because they always think there's an editor coming and, and the editor is putting things in and and unless it's a shared world, you're not uh, you're not actually you know you usually don't have any direct contact with the other authors. You know there's no direct feedback. But once that anthology is out in the world, at that point it does become a collaboration because you're all trying to promote the same piece the same work. Yeah. But n the the number of people who actually approach it that way, like I don't think that I've like the the times that I see anthologies that seem to do well, it's when the editors are thinking about it that way and are helping the authors, but I don't think that I've ever seen a group of authors in an anthology in in any of the ones that I've done get together and say, "Hey, we are all in this anthology together." Let's see what we can do to cross promote each other. Right. Like you'll you'll see people do that with uh, humble bundles on a novel level sometimes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I've been thinking about that and uh, and thinking specifically like that's an opportunity for a lot of. In it's one of those places that uh, it feels like there's a good overlap of right. possibles for for indie and, and traditional traditional authors. So that was one of the reasons that I thought it would be fun to talk about. But uh, honestly, I was going to try to pick your brain as much as anything else. I mean, yeah, it's really interesting because uh, anthologies have been a, a, a recurring tool for the indie publishing sphere uh, in a way that I don't think traditional publishing has leveraged. Not quite. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, and there's – there's some some practices that I think are maybe a little on the scammy side, so you need to really 
yeah be aware of what the rules and laws and you know and etiquette are uh but uh yeah these are, it's a remarkable tool and you know we we have our whole royalty splitting thing now specifically to make that kind of thing easier uh yeah. so that you know because one of the the hang-ups with putting together an anthology has always been managing things like paying people for the you know splitting the royalties determining mm -hmm. who gets what Handle, you know, taking care of the tax situation, yeah. you know, so we take care of all that stuff. Yeah. That's our Which plug. Is... That's my plug for us in that, but that's not See what that was See how nicely I did that segue for you? <laughs> Thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't it... going to do to plug us on things like that, but that's a pretty important one if we're going to talk about anthologies. So. But but it, it, it is it, it is true that's, that that's one of the, the things that uh, that is hard. And and the other thing about anthologies also is that it's one of the ways that a lot of authors, when, when something terrible happens the way they want to 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 yeah. try to do uh, to do fundraising for it yeah. and and that's that again you know that's a way that for authors to collaborate without um without having to do a lot of uh okay i'll take your prose and yeah you know yeah so it, it's just it's something that i've been noodling with about, I, about thinking wish about I had... anthology as a as an active form of collaboration yeah. I, and this is very and and mark Mark Lefebvre agrees, by the way. Yeah, he loves the idea. Um, uh, now I wish I had asked this question at the beginning because uh, you know <laughs> we're at the we're at the end of the show now, uh, and, and and I think this would have been a very interesting conversation, which just means we're going to have to t chat again. Uh, I, and, yeah, my heart bleeds. Hash this out, <laughs> Mary. I've always loved you. You uh, you you're are one of my Kevin. favorite people, and uh, I love what you're doing uh, through your work. It, all aspects of your work, uh, CIFLA included, uh, the stuff that you do for other authors has been phenomenal. So I cannot thank you enough for uh, being a guest on the show. So thank uh, thanks you. for inviting me. Thanks for reaching out. It was, of course. It was really I should good. have it's done always... it sooner. <laughs> That's on then, me. Then, then I wouldn't have been able to give you that fantastic scoop. I'm just, I'm just thrilled that we, uh, you wrote D to D in one of your notebooks. That's all. Uh, oh, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, uh, within the sound of my voice, thank you for being a part of the show as well. Um, uh, the rigmarole here at the end is, is always pretty much the same. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and Facebook uh, slash draft to digital on both of those. We'll get you to our accounts and we appreciate it. And make sure you're bookmarking D to D live because that's where you get countdowns for live broadcasts like these. So that's very important. And, of course, make sure you are checking out selfpublishinginsiders.com. I'm breaking all the marketing rules, Mary, because I always give them multiple CTAs at the end of these things. You know, uh, <laughs> it's just more opportunity for exploration. That's what it is. So many things, everybody. So, uh, And, of course, make sure you check out CIFWA and Mary Robinette Kowal's website, which I believe is Mary Robinette Kowal. At Kowal .com. Com. <laughs> Yeah. A mouthful for sure, but well worth the Google. Uh, so go and check that out. Mary, thank you again for being a thank part of the you. show. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all next time.